Some people know um, in September I was traveling in Belfast and down in the Republic of Ireland and then across uh, in, uh, the water in London. I don't I can't remember where I was, but I was watching some BBC talk show that we were talking about some tweak to the NHS, to the national health system in uh, England. And this panel is having this conversation and somebody in the course of discussing this tweak says, well, if we're not careful with something like this, we could wind up deteriorating into an American-style healthcare system. And then everybody else on the panel sort of says, well, oh, no, that could never happen, or it could never get that bad, or, I mean, certainly nobody in the panel ever said, well, they've got great healthcare there. Nobody said that. And I think that's a thing that Americans who don't travel very much don't understand, that there are many things about our society that people in other societies wouldn't be willing to give up what they have to get, because it's a very much an American attitude that we have the best of everything. All you have to do is listen to three hours of Rush Limbaugh, and you will be told that over and over again, that everything that we have is the best. We are the best, and we are the dominant civilization in the world. Uh, we're going to be exploring that from a bunch of different angles here on the show today, but we're going to start out with uh, somebody that we've been privileged to have before, Yasha Munk, lecturer on government at Harvard, host of the Good Fight podcast and the author of The People Versus Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It, uh, will be published in March and is available on pre-order now. So welcome back to the show, Yasha. Thank you so much, Colin. So apropos of what I just said there, there's a phrase that's starting to make the rounds a little bit, the notion of a post-America era, the sense that the United States, to whatever extent it was first among nations, can't even really make that argument for itself anymore. How much of that notion do you embrace? I became a citizen uh, half a year ago. I still think that America in many ways can have its best days before it. But it is not as obvious as it was, and it'll take some real change and some real reform. And that's true across a whole range of sectors. When you look at why it is that America has always been special, it's the American dream. It's the idea that the American middle class has a much higher living standard than other people. Well, I'll tell you what. In the United States, over the past 30 years, the average American household has not had an improvement in the standard of living. In a country like Sweden, starting from a somewhat lower base, the standard of living of the average suite has actually increased 60% over the same time period. People are catching up. In China, the GDP per capita of coastal China, so when you don't take sort of the central regions or the rural regions, but you just look at the urban parts of China, it is now essentially the same as it is in the United States. So on standard of living, it's not as obvious as it, as it used to be. And in terms of global power and global prestige and global respect, it's no longer the case in the same way. And there, of course, lies the great irony of uh, our current foreign policy and our current posture in the world, that somebody who promised to make America respected in the world again, promised to exert power again in the world, is actually making the country less respected than it has been at any point in living memory, and systematically undermining its power, by undermining the alliances which the United States has always needed in order to exert its power and influence around the world. Well, let's talk about those alliances for a second. So one of the spectacles that we've had over the last week or so took place uh, among uh, the European nations still pursuing uh, the Paris Climate Accords, and we, we even had them mischievously posing for photographs beside a French pavilion where there was a sign saying, make our planet great again. Here's this kind of impish tweaking uh, of Donald Trump for uh, dropping out of, I mean, he's dropped out of the Paris climate, of course, to uh, some extent. I mean, you know, we, this notion of European leaders posing mischievously <laughs> next to a sign that pretty clearly makes fun, fun of Donald Trump for, for not going all in on the climate accords. That seems to me like a, a moment that's just kind of describing a different status for the United States. Look, I mean, Europe has for a very long time relied on the United States for its security and for, for, for its long-term planning, but it's also helped project American power around the world. The United States has been so powerful in the Cold War and since because it had all of those incredibly powerful allies. And so when a very careful politician like Angela Merkel says, as she did a few months ago, that the times in which we can completely rely on the United States is to a certain degree gone, 
that really shows that uh, European leaders are starting to think, well, can we rely on a country that elects somebody like Donald Trump to be its president? And if we can't, doesn't that mean that we, to some degree, have to hedge our bets between Russia and the United States, between China and the United States? And I think that that is a very bad, very dangerous thing, that the world will be a much worse place in the long run if we don't have American leadership of Europe and other countries to make sure that our values and our political system remains the most powerful in the world. So the spectacle of a whole bunch of European leaders sort of openly making fun of the American president because they clearly see him as some sort of irrational and they think that they have such a bad relationship with him that they can sort of make fun of him that way because they don't have much to expect from him in any way is a real sign of decay of a, of a strategic partnership between the United States and, and its long-term partners. There are some who would say, you know what, this isn't really anything new. And there are ways in which the current moment harks back to decades and decades and decades ago. And I'll give you an example and let you react to it. So over the course of his Asian travels, Donald Trump took time for a one-on-one or a bilateral meeting with Duterte in the Philippines. Duterte is ruthless. He is involved in extrajudicial executions, probably of thousands of his people. He will almost undoubtedly be overthrown someday. And the people who overthrow him will remember whatever uh, favorable light the the United States and its president were willing to cast upon him uh, and probably not think very gratefully of that. And maybe you can comment on that. Well, you know, I think that there's been sort of two big traditions of foreign policy in the United States, sort of liberals and realists, right? And liberals have said, look, it's really important that we only really be friends of democracies. You know, perhaps in certain moments it's necessary to cooperate <laughs> with non-democracies, but when we do, we want to, you know, keep a very, very large distance to them, not help them too much, really show that we disapprove of them. And realists, you know, people like Henry Kissinger have for a long time said, you know what, there are certain parts in the world in which we don't have any friends, in which there's never going to be, uh, at least not in the next few years, a liberal democracy that's going to be functioning, and we need to do business there. So, you know, in those circumstances where we don't have a democratic partner to deal with, we are willing to make friends with them. We're willing even to support them because we're afraid of what might come after them. But even they had a preference for dealing with democracies. The closest allies, the people who they felt the most kinship with, were democracies. And so I think that what Trump did in uh, the Philippines with, with Duterte, what he has done with Al Sisi of Egypt, what he has done even when he gave very strong support to the far-right populist government of Poland that is undermining uh, a democracy that seemed stable a few years ago when he was in Warsaw with his big speech, is to actually signal, you know what, I feel closer to those dictators than to the Democrats. Even in a region like Europe, I actually feel closer to the Polish government than I do to the French government or the German government or the Italian government. And that, to me, is something genuinely new in American foreign policy and something that's going to undermine um, not just America's alliances, but, but the rule of law and, and, and the survival of democracy in regions where its survival is very much at risk, like Central Europe or like parts of Asia. I also want to ask you, you recently became a citizen, and I know that there were people that you knew in your life who thought you were kind of buying a stock that had peaked a long time ago. Why would you want to be an American citizen now? What was your response to that? Well, it was a few things. I mean, the first is that, you know, I, I've been using the term liberal democracy a lot. I should probably explain what I mean by it. I mean, to me, it is the combination of the rule of the people and the rule of law. But we have a system in which we both actually translate what people want into public policy, and we make sure that we have a Bill of Rights, that individual rights are respected, that we are subject to laws rather than subject to the arbitrary whim of any man. That idea in the modern world comes from America, comes from the American Revolution, and has been upheld and guaranteed in many ways, despite certain missteps in foreign policy over the last 50 years, which we shouldn't deny, by the United States of America. And I think if democracy failed in the United States, it would be very difficult for it to thrive in other parts of the world as well. So that's the first reason. I want to be part of defending this political system in which I, I deeply believe. The second thing is that America has 
deep challenges around identity and around its history of racial injustice and around ongoing discrimination and police violence and all of those things. But as somebody who grew up in Europe, I also can see how much further along we actually are in the United States towards building a multi-ethnic democracy, towards building a democracy in which we recognize that you can be American irrespective of whether you're white or brown or black, irrespective of what your religion is. And that, to me, is, is another idea that I deeply believe in, that we shouldn't be defined by the color of our skin or, 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 or by who we worship to or by whether we worship a god at all. And if we want to preserve that idea, again, uh, I think the United States is a place where it's most likely to work. Um, we've been talking to Yasha Munk. I want to end where we begin, but I also want to remind you, uh, he's a lecturer uh, on government at Harvard, host of the Good Fight podcast, and the author of The People vs. Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It. It'll be published in March. You can pre-order it already. So I just want to go back to the way in which we're viewed in the world. When one travels, you can get a little sense of it. But I mean, people are probably too polite to say everything <laughs> that they think. And, and you know, I mean, look, we've got 4.4 percent of the world's population. Pick a resource and we use it disproportionately to our size. And I think we own 42 percent of the world's guns. We have 31 percent of the world's mass shooters. If I live in Denmark or pick a country in Western Europe or pick a country in lots of other places in the world. If I look, lived in Japan, I, I would look at this country and say, you guys are nuts. You're, you're, you're big, you're greedy, you're wasteful, you're violent. Now you've elected a president who doesn't really see any role for this superpower in, in big problems like climate change, doesn't even really acknowledge the reality of climate change. I feel as though Americans are very insulated from the gaze of the world at them? You know, every country is a little nuts in its own way. And it's always easier to see how other countries are, are nuts in the country you grew up in, right? I mean, Germans think that it's absolutely ridiculous that Americans have these gun laws. But of course, in Germany, you can drive down uh, a motorway at 200 miles an hour legally. And that really increases the death toll that you have from car accidents in this country. And, and people somehow don't think that that is as nuts as Americans might think. So America is a big, very diverse country, and so perhaps it's a little bit more nuts than others, and it has some things that are more dysfunctional, actually, than other countries that also have some greater strengths. What's clear, though, is that, you know, Donald Trump is not just a continuation of that. He's an aberration, and he's perceived as that. Um, you know, there's always been waves of anti-Americanism in, in Europe and in Asia, People didn't particularly like George W. Bush in this country. They didn't particularly like George W. Bush um, uh, throughout much of Asia. But they didn't think of it as the sort of rank embarrassment that a lot of them do think of Trump as. And they didn't think of him as somebody erratic who you just cannot predict how, wh what he's going to do. And, and, and even further countries, supposed to your ally, really you're just scared of what they're going to do next. And so... I don't worry so much about what the average European, about what the average Asian thinks about the United States, but I do worry about whether it's going to impact a foreign policy in the long run and whether it is going to undermine the ability of liberal democracies around the world to stand together and defend themselves against resurgent authoritarian regimes like China and Russia and resurgent of Italian populists in places like Turkey and Hungary and Poland. You know, when people from other countries come here, they're kind of freaked out by our level of flag worship, by our level uh, of uh, patriotic exhibitionism, of the need to have the national anthem played before every single sports event, every single thing that possibly happens, and to pledge allegiance to the flag at every opportunity. I mean, the level of self-celebration almost suggests a level of insecurity that lies underneath it. I'm all in favor of self-celebration, actually. And, and, you know, the reason is that the flag means something different. Mm. In Europe, the flag still implies a particular ethnicity, mm -hmm. a particular imagined community of people who've lived together for the last 2,000 years. And so by its nature, it excludes immigrants and, and their descendants. It doesn't have to. This is in the process of slowly changing but one of the reasons why so many people, uh, not just in Germany, which obviously has a special history, but even in countries like Italy or, or, or France, 
would be uncomfortable with all of that flag waving is that they feel like it is excluding all of those people who haven't been Italian or French for generations and generations. In, in the United States, the flag has always meant an ideal, not an ideal that's always been adapted to, but an ideal of people coming together from different parts of the world and being united by the Pledge of Allegiance, by a set of commitments to a political system, to political ideals. And I actually think that that's something that the United States shouldn't change, that we need to defend it. We need to defend it against some people on, on the left who are so disgusted by what's going on at the moment and who've come to conclude that America's flaws are so much a feature of the system rather than a bug that we need to get rid of all national symbols altogether. And, and we also need to defend it against the attempt by people who are white nationalists who want to say, no, the American flag is, uh, stands for a white Christian nation. I, I'm all in favor of that self-celebration. I'm all in favor of singing the national anthem uh, in front of, you know, before every sports game, as long as we defend what it is that, that we mean when we do that. That's a great, great point, and it's a great place to end. Yasha Munk, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Okay, bye-bye. Coming up, we're going to turn things around. We're going to talk to an American expat living in Turkey about how things look to her. I like to say a few words of our country Those people aren't bad nor are they mean Now the leaders we have while well, they're the worst that we've had are hardly the worst this poor world has seen Let's turn history's pages, shall we? Take the Caesars, for example. While with the first few of them, they would sleep with their sister. We're talking to Susie Hansen. Uh, her book is Notes on a Foreign Country, an American Abroad in a Post-American World. Um, Susie Hansen, welcome to this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Um, maybe we should set the stage first by explaining uh, what it is you mean by uh, an American abroad. You've lived in particular in Turkey for a very long time. How long is it now? I have now been there for 10 years. Um, so when I first started writing the book, I had been there. That was in 2013. I had been there for five years. I moved to Turkey in 2007 for a journalism fellowship. And, and one of the things that you are in this book is uh, critical of yourself initially uh, for, for what you did and didn't know uh, about Turkey, um, how well you understood the relationship between the U.S. and Turkey. Say, say more about that. You know, I didn't know. I had never lived abroad before. I was very interested in the rest of the world. But then when I got there, it sort of surprised me the, the extent and the depth of America's relationship with Turkey. And that was very dismaying to me because I thought, OK, well, I've done all of this reading to prepare myself for this fellowship, which is a two year fellowship. And yet somehow I didn't realize that, you know, that the American military had had a pretty large number of soldiers on Turkish soil in the 40s and 50s, that there was a very strong anti-American movement in Turkey in the 1960s, and that really Turks had felt that the United States had been involved in their politics for, you know, the last 60 years, very deeply involved, and sometimes often to negative effects. If we had had this very long relationship, then that meant maybe even unconsciously I had certain ideas about Turkey or prejudices against Turkey that I didn't entirely understand myself. When you say America has been involved, uh, we need to convey that even more. For example, even something as basic as the patterns of roads in, in Turkey. Yeah. Uh, you, tell that story. Well, you know, we do learn about what I say in the book. Is that I did learn about the Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine, doctrine and that Greece and Turkey were two of the primary beneficiaries of those two plans, um, but I didn't realize the extent of it. I mean, we were really rebuilding these countries, and that is always portrayed to us as this kind of charitable act and this very generous act, and in some ways you can look at it that way. But I think that we neglect to understand the extent to which we are also remaking those countries in our image. So, for example, our 
advisors came in in the 40s and 50s, and we sort of um, helped to rebuild the Turkish military, which is a very venerable institution in Turkey and seemed to me to be a very Turkish institution, but yet it had been sort of remade by the Americans. We built a lot of their roads, um, and we also had a lot to do with forming the philosophy uh, of and the organization of their unions, their labor unions, which of course had to a certain degree a certain political bent, or at least was trying to prevent those unions from having a too leftist bent. And so all of these things um, would, would come to cause a backlash on the part of the Turks against the Americans because it was too much intervention, it was too much influence. And I think that also it created um, a pattern that lasts to this day, which is to see a foreign country like Turkey as maybe a third world country, in quotes, um, as a c- country that's behind us, and as a country that is in need of modernization or in need of our help, right? And this is all kind of portrayed in a very benevolent way. But what you're saying essentially is that you are behind us, and so you have to catch up, and you're never really seeing a country on its own terms, and this can be very dangerous. Right, and not to harp on this road thing, but I mean, what the Turks wanted were essentially highways that would connect the major areas uh, of the country, the big, the biggest cities of the country. And, and the American overseers said, no, nah, we don't think so. Uh, we think the roads should work differently. And they thought they should work differently for, for different reasons. And, and consequently, there were no roads linking those major cities for many, many years. I think that what I'm trying to draw attention to is that we don't tend to, as Americans, think of ourselves as having this kind of impact on these countries. I mean, we know about invasions, we know about coups, maybe, um, but we don't know about this almost smaller stuff. And I think that that was why, you know, having, going to Turkey was an interesting experience for me and a very important one because it's, it was a country that it didn't have as, as large of a historical legacy for myself or for most Americans. It was a more subtle and more nuanced relationship, but it did have a, a, a serious impact on an individual lives. And as I lived abroad, I began to go to foreign countries and really think about this more deeply. Okay, well, well you know, how, does, how did this treaty <laughs> affect an Egyptian's life? And when you start to think that way, you realize that you are yourself connected to those people. You know, we, that this relationship is a very deep and intimate one, and that we have these intimate relationships all over the world that have been going on for almost 60 years, and yet, for some reason, Americans don't really feel a very strong emotional connection to that relationship, and I think that that is part of the problem. A generalized problem is that we, uh, historically, uh, over from post-World War II forward, and, uh, at minimum, have had these heavy involvements on all these countries, which the average American is simply not aware of. And then, periodically, something happens in one of these countries, and we, we say, oh, look Look at what you're doing right now. Look what you're doing. And whereas the people in the country are, countries are saying, in the immortal words of Taylor Swift, look what you made us do. Do you, do you, do you think you had any... Often, you, often that's what they're saying. I mean, it, it is very complicated. One of the things that I point out is because the rest of the world does know America very well. This was something that I, and Americans very well, they know our history, they know our culture. And so they're having a complicated relationship with us, which is sometimes they're angry and sometimes they're not. You know, sometimes they admire certain things about us. Whereas our relationship with them is really quite murky and we, you know, we don't really know that that much about them. It's not a very complicated relationship. But in the case of Erdogan, I mean, that's always a very fascinating example for me to watch play out because it's sort of, everybody loves to hate Erdogan right now, but probably very few people think about the fact that, you know, to to a lot of Turks in Turkey, they believe that someone like Erdogan, the rise of Erdogan, very much had to do with American involvement in American policies, not because they installed him or something, you know, sort of conspiratorial like that, but because we were encouraging at one point Turkey to go in both a more capitalistic direction and also, frankly, a a slightly more religious direction. And this is something we probably don't think, uh, would, would never occur to us that we would have encouraged a country like Turkey that we often think of as this, you know, perfect secularist country or whatever model secularist country, that we would have ever encouraged that. But we did in the 1980s for various reasons, mostly to counter the force of communism and, and, and leftism. 
and that which was a greater danger to us. And consequently, someone like Erdogan might not have ever come about uh, in Turkey had we not, you know, to a certain degree encouraged that. I'm not saying that the U.S. is responsible for his rise, but it's, it, the news is more interesting if you do take this history into account, you know. We have used over the years a lot of rhetoric about what America can export uh, from its position as a shining city on a hill, uh, uh, that we can, we can export democracy and justice and fairness and free elections. And I mean, another thing I think that we talk about or imply that we can export is a particular mode of journalism, which is rigorously objective and fact-checked. As a journalist abroad, you've, I think, encountered different views of what American journalism actually is. Yeah, this was fascinating, and I think, you know, because I hadn't been a foreign correspondent before, and I think that you really see how there is a certain amount of arrogance in the American journalism community, and I think it's general, but I saw it more pronounced abroad because you're comparing American journalism to other countries' journalism. And so there's this tendency to believe that American journalism is, you know, the only objective form of journalism that's uniquely objective because we have certain standards and certain rules of fact-checking and, you know, two sources for every fact and all of this kind of stuff. And that the perception seems to be that other people's journalism is ideological in a way that Americans are not. And this becomes very funny when you really start thinking about it, because here is the most powerful country in the world that is producing this journalism. Of course it's going to be. It could be perhaps the most ideological in certain ways. Um, But I found that, you know, this was not really – I hadn't quite thought about all of this until I went abroad. And foreigners were saying to me, including this one young Turkish man who was saying – whatever you are sending back about my country is being used by the empire. And that information is very precious. What you write is very important. It's going possibly directly to Washington, but what do you really know about us? What do you really know about this place? I think I say in the book that, you know, an American, an objective American mind is still first and foremost an American mind. And unfortunately, whether we admit that or not, I really do believe that deep down that way of looking at the world is that everyone is sort of beneath us. I want to come back to a part of that, but I also want to circle back right now to a word you used earlier because I think it's a good example of that uh, way in which we carry our mindset uh, into these areas that have different mindsets. One of the ways that we measure, without even really thinking about it, the state of some other country is often modernization. They've become more modern. They've modernized themselves. And it's implied that that's a good thing, that they are catching up to uh, many of the advantages uh, that presumably come with modernization. Modernization. And what we miss is that it's, you know, in the case of Iran, maybe you want to say a little bit about that. It's almost a, the opposite, right? It's kind of a dirty word. It is sort of well known in, in some circles that there was this thing called modernization theory that was very much a post-World War II theory that came out of academic circles, but that these academic circles then very much influenced the United States government and were in fact sponsored by the CIA at one point, this group of intellectuals in Boston. And this modernization theory basically was in response to the fact that, okay, Britain and France are giving up their empire to a certain degree. We're going to have to take over. There are all of these countries that are sort of, in in the American view, I guess, left hanging. And we're going to have to be the ones to take the place of the Europeans. How are we going to do that? Well, we're not going to do colonialism because we know that that's bad now and that has a bad that has a a bad connotation and it's racist and we're not racist because we're americans but eventually what they came to believe was that you know if they wanted to implement modernization schemes that was going to have to involve of course you know privatization of the economy because they were trying to create bulwarks against communism also urbanization was a big one i mean that was something we encouraged that these intellectuals decided that the, the people best uh, suited to implementing these policies were dictators, I mean, military dictators, essentially. And one of the countries, and, and Turkey was one of the countries that we had that general attitude about, and Iran was a big one. And our support for the Shah of Iran is very obviously very controversial, not just in Iran, but all throughout the Middle East. He was a brutal ruler. We tend to see him in retrospect. I mean, some people do with some nostalgia. Oh, he was a secular leader, and therefore he was better than the Ayatollah Khomeini. But the Ayatollah Khomeini, you know, rose up in direct relationship to the brutal policies of the Shah and the United States. I think because modernization does have this positive connotation to our ears, we have to consider that possibly the 
Cold War architects very deliberately made it that way. You know, they, they, they determined it for us. Modernization was going to be seen as a positive thing. And so we, it's very hard to counter propaganda, essentially. You know, one thing that I struggled with, I've struggled with it a lot lately, and it is, for example, I was appalled during the Bush administration when we openly began torturing people in the post-9-11 environment. Now, as your book makes clear in that Iran chapter, we know that U.S. operatives were helping to train the Shah's Savak torturers. And then you bring up with an older Turkish journalist that anecdote. And she says, let me tell you something. Americans also taught our generals how to torture. I, I sort of wonder how that, whether that militates against feeling particularly outraged during the, the post 9-11 years. Yeah. One could in kind of a jaded way go, well, of, yes, well, we always did that. Yeah, I had moments where I thought that way, I have to say. It sort of felt like this was a moment when we needed to talk about the fact that, we, well, we also used to just kill people, you know, and we used to just assassinate leaders. And the CIA was always involved in very dirty deeds in the 50s and 60s. But it, it, I think that there's always this weird place that we return to when a new outrage happens, where there's almost this sort of suggestion of, well, it used to be better. We used to be better. We've fallen from some sort of grace. Part of the problem is this myth that we have been somehow better than other countries in the world on in terms of things like torture. And we, we, we need to see ourselves as better for some reason. And that's something that I really was trying to, to understand in my book, because I think it's not just important to us when we think about our country, but it's, I think that we as individuals take a tremendous amount of self-esteem. We take some sort of solid is from the idea that we are somehow good. It's interesting to think about why that's so important and what would happen if we had to really just look at the reality of it all. Now, I'm not saying that we have to think of ourselves as horrible and have a tremendous amount of guilt and shame, but I think it's precisely this problem of this good versus bad dichotomy that's so simplistic. It's like, no, the record's much, much, much more complicated, of course. You know, all you have to do is bring this kind of thing up. You can, all you have to do is say on the 4th of July, well, really, all those foundational documents don't really include slaves or native peoples who are being extirpated, or for that matter, either, even women. We can go on and on, you know, a large portion of Americans will get really, really angry at you, you know, and, and we can't do truth and reconciliation because of that, because we can't do truth. Living abroad, do you have any perspective on, like, why is that? Why, why do we cling to that more than, say, Germany ever would? Um, I mean, I think that everybody has this tendency. I mean, nationalism, the formation of a lot of nation states demanded this kind of attitude and this way of thinking. And it's very, very important to governments to be able to manipulate that way of thinking and to be able to tap into it. And it's happening in many, many different countries. The, the problem is, 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 again, because we have more power and we have had more uh, ability to commit violent acts around the world, um, and we still do. For example, I can remember when I was going through my first phases of being critical of the U.S. and Turkey, and my Turkish friend said, you're so hard on the Americans. I mean, we don't, Turks don't know about you know, let's say, you know, Iraq or, or the, even the, the eastern lands in their own country. They don't, they don't know these things, too. And why do you expect Americans to know or to think about themselves differently? And it's like, of course, well, Turkey's not invading other countries. They don't have such an influence in the way that the world is governed. But the United States has had that power, and it does still have that power. And, you know, we have done some very reckless and irresponsible things because of this reflex of nationalism. First of all, we have to call it nationalism. We don't even call, really, until Trump, we have not brought that word out. I mean, these, new, these words have come back that we never would ever have used, nationalism, fascism. So I think that the first thing is, is to understand what this force really is, rather than sort of settling back into this comfortable feeling of, well, it's our patriotism, and that's a special kind of patriotism, and we're not the types of people to be prone to using, you know, nationalist violence. Well, clearly we are. But that's what makes us exceptional, is that we have this unique amount of power in the world, and we always have. Well, Susie Hansen, we have to leave it here, but I'm uh, hoping people will carry the conversation forward, especially by reading Notes on a Foreign Country and American Abroad in a Post-American World. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. In our final segment, we'll talk to um, Eman Ismail, a video producer and editor at Slate Magazine, a Muslim American of Egyptian descent with a different perspective on our place in the world. No one likes us 
I don't know why We may not be perfect But heaven knows we try But all around Even our old friends put us down Let's drop the big one And see what happens We give them money But are they grateful? No, they're spiteful China, Turkey, Brussels Do these places not appreciate that their very names come from things we Americans use at Thanksgiving? You're welcome. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me, Kyone Wolf. Our intern is Sarah Bly. The part of Bill Curry was played by Liam Neeson. On tomorrow's show, the nose speed dates through a long list of topics, including elephants and Blake Shelton. And now, back to Colin. All right, so for our final segment, we're going to maybe turn the, the telescope around in a slightly different angle, uh, although it's all kind of the same question, which is how do we fit our idea in, of America into our idea of the world, and how does the world regard America? Um, to uh, help us out with this is somebody who's been on the show before, uh, Eman Ismail, a video producer and editor at Slate Magazine, where he's got a well, video series called Who's Afraid of Eman Ismail, where he travels around to different places and explores different topics, all of them connected uh, to our um, maybe misunderstandings and, and fears about people living among us. So first of all, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. Um, you know, on one of your one of my favorite moments uh, in one of your uh, videos is a moment is a video that you did about um, Ramadan and how difficult, how much more difficult in many ways Ramadan is to um, experience and observe uh, in America because a whole bunch of other people around you are not doing it, uh, and you spend a lot of time with uh, guys who are cooking in these halal trucks who they, they themselves uh, cannot eat all day, but they're just hovering over all this aromatic. Food. But at the end of the day, you uh, and some other uh, uh, members of your uh, family, I guess, and, and maybe friends as well, repair to a restaurant that is, let me see if I can get this right. It's a Chinese restaurant run by Latin Americans catering to Muslims. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's New Jersey in a nutshell. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, that's sort of a, it's, that's a nice feeling, that the, the, a feeling that maybe, at least in this tiny little corner, our dream of the melting pot is working. Or, or am I idealizing that? No, I mean, it totally works. Uh, I think one of the things that makes especially the United States so different than the rest of the world is that nobody really has claim to, to saying this is what American culture is. It's constantly being pulled in so many different directions by so many different peoples with different traditions and religions and practices and everything. Uh, so I think if you were to go to New Jersey and ask anyone in the street, uh, what is the vibe of this neighborhood or what is the culture, every single person you'll talk to is a, will give you a different answer. Uh, and the best part about that is that it's a good place to be different, and it's a good place to grow up if you aren't really sure about what America is or its place in the, in the world. Uh, because it's, it feels like we're there together to make it happen. That particular neighborhood uh, may be a good place to grow up if you feel that way. But, I mean, as your own video suggests, and as we know anyway, it, as you venture out of those enclaves into different parts of America, first of all, you run into a lot of people who would contradict the statement that you just made. Oh, no, no, there actually is... Uh, a, a prevalent vision of America, and and there's also things which we can exclude, things that are being observed and practiced and done in America, which we, this kind of vague, centrist uh, idea of ourselves, we can exclude that from our vision. I mean, isn't that what you're running into all the time in your videos is people saying, no, nope, no, nope, yeah, I'm sorry, we may have a melting pot here, but you're not American. That's not American. Yeah, totally. Uh, in one of the episodes, we were trying to unpack Sharia law and whether or not it's enforced here in America. Uh, and there's this law that I think that's been passed in 13 different states so far, banning the concept of Sharia law entirely. And uh, we talked to the lawmaker in Texas, uh, where it recently passed this summer, and he maintained that there is a concrete uh, and tangible idea of what American culture is, and we need to protect that from the immigrants that are coming into this country, and in my mind are contributing to it. And one of the points that he made was, well, you know, if you're welcome to come to Texas, but you can't tell me how to live my life, therefore there's this standard of what Texan life is that everybody shares there in Texas. But I challenged him to, to 
to the concept of, okay, well, if you come into New York, your cowboy hat might look like a costume. Or if you go into a few states uh, away in uh, anywhere, you know, you can go to Las Vegas and it's different, California. Uh, you can go to Baltimore. All these different cities have their own unique American experiences. And I think you're really selling America short if you're going to try to describe it as having a singular identity. Um, your mother uh, has said that she actually in some ways regrets having moved to America from Egypt. Tell me why she says that. Yeah, that's that kind of really, really, uh, I, I guess, ripples out with everybody else that has like, these immigrant parents that had an idealistic I, uh, version of this life that they wanted to live uh, in America. And it's one of the things that you leave behind is that security of knowing exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so my mother wanted to raise Egyptian Muslim kids in America. And the only reason she came here was to help her sister, who had moved here before, to help her raise her kids. So in the house, she made sure to only speak to us in Arabic so we can learn it. And I'm really happy that she did, because I do speak Arabic now, thanks to her. Uh, but uh, when we grew up and we all went to college and we all went our different directions, there are certain things about uh, specifically Egyptian culture that she misses and sort of regrets that she didn't instill in us more. Like the idea of uh, sharing meals together. Like we would always go out and eat separately with our friends and come home. Uh, that's sort of an alien concept to a, a mother who grew up in Egypt in the 50s. It's usually uh, her responsibility to bring everybody together. But it's, it kind of goes beyond that. This is the way we practice our religion here is different because uh, everybody who does practice Islam in America does it in their own way. And when you go to a place like Egypt where they have entire blocks, where everybody kind of goes to the same mosque and the same uh, families are called, have like the same backgrounds and everything, it's a little different. And religion plays a different role. It's more of a community organizing um, tool. And when you come to the West, it's more of an identity and something that you feel like you have to defend and also adjust. So I think uh, her regrets really stem from having this idealistic uh, version of what she hoped her kids would be, and seeing that we just grew up to be American anyway kind of breaks her heart a little bit. You know, a lot of your videos be begin or near the beginning include these clips from conservative media, uh, Fox News and other outlets that are just sort of incredibly either hostile towards or dismissive of or, or phobic about uh, Islam. And, and uh, of course, piled on top of that is uh, the presidency of Donald Trump, uh, the uh, attempts at immigration bans. And I don't know if you've been had a chance to explore this much with the people that you've talked to. But one thing that I wonder about now is... Uh, I, I mean, I, I think your mother had reasons to have certain expectations when she came to uh, America. Some of those expectations were met and some of them weren't. Some, some of the surprises she got here were, were, were not surprises that she was particularly enjoying. I, I wonder now what somebody who's emigrating here from a Muslim country thinks. You know, in, in other words, I'm wondering uh, whether it's, I'm even wondering why it's attractive at this point, given, you know, given how much resistance there is from certain parts of this country, starting with the White House, why Muslims are still willing and, and wanting to come here. Uh, I, I feel like it really heavily depends on where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're coming from a place like Syria, really, it feels like such a privilege to be annoyed by what people are <laughs> saying about you on TV. Yeah. Uh, I met this one Syrian family that uh, came and they moved to California. And their biggest struggle was, you know, just communicating to people and trying to get the time to learn English in a, in a formal way so they can talk to other people. And they're constantly having to get on the phone with translators and everything. And the struggle is real, you know. Uh, they had this comfortable life before the war broke out. Uh, the guy that I met was... Uh, he was a jiu-jitsu champion, and he would travel the world teaching jiu-jitsu. Uh, and now he's just sort of, his biggest problem of the day isn't what Bill Maher is saying about what, how Muslims think or uh, what Tucker Carlson is trying to make, uh, make a point about how Muslims shouldn't be welcome here. But, you know, his issues are, are different than mine or any other American Muslim growing up here in the luxury of, you know, feeling safe and having a secure life. Uh, so I think a lot of what... Uh, people want when they come to this country is to participate in like the successful economy or all the different schools and ed education options. And, uh, you know, despite what uh, I'm feeling or despite what anybody else is feeling about 
our identities. You know, we could still go to college and study whatever we want. You know, that's something that isn't really an option in a lot of places of the world, especially in a place like Egypt. Like, my cousins have to leave the country to work for several months at a time before they can come back and spend it. And uh, that's something that's unimaginable here in America. Imagine leaving to Canada to go work for six months just because the jobs here just don't exist. So I think it's, it's a real luxury to, to feel upset about your identity feeling under attack that uh, some people might not even care about when they're, when they're looking about where they want to live and the future of their children. I thought one of the most interesting and telling uh, videos you made was a conversation you had with uh, someone who uh, was a, a young man who was a former uh, Islamic extremist and now works uh, as a consultant, basically, uh, a kind of counterterrorism um, consultant. A- and, you know, what he said was really interesting, and I- I'll just apply it to myself for a second. I'm of Irish heritage. If for most of my young life people treated me like an IRA bomber, you know, that, that basically I was this like, tremendously dangerous person uh, who, ver- who very, mi- very likely, you know, at some point would blow up something in the United States. After a while, I- 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 maybe I would start thinking, well, maybe I should just be that person. Person, if that's who you think I am, and if that's what you know, if, that, if that's how you identify me, maybe that's how I should identify myself. And that's kind of part of what he was saying that that some of the w- things that were projected onto him uh, as an ar- uh, arrival here, uh, uh, as a person living in the West, started to make him think that way. Yeah, uh, it goes back to that novel written by Richard Wright, Native Son, mm-hmm. uh, where if you continuously treat someone as if they were supposed to become a certain thing eventually they might turn into that certain thing. And it's a shame that, that that's, what Mubin ex- was ex- uh, that's what his experience was. But in a lot of ways, uh, it was familiar, you know, and uh, it, it kind of made sense. There were so many times in my life where I felt so alien and so different. Uh, and that's by in part by uh, how Muslims were portrayed in media or, you know, watching like the latest episode of Homeland, and then I hear the familiar call to prayer, but in the context of a bomb blowing up, uh, all these things that relate me to what I call, like, the bad people or the, the bad side and terrorism and all these awful crimes against humanity. But if you com- uh, continuously push people who live here and were born here and relate them to people on the other side, then what you're really saying is you're not with us. And no matter what, because of how you look or the circumstance that you were born into, you're forever going to be with them. And I think if you isolate people and keep them outside of the fringe of society, that's when you have uh, just the worst-case scenarios where, in this case, he had left to Pakistan to, uh, to, to study his religion. And there he met all of those uh, the Taliban fighters who influenced him and, uh, and were able to seduce him with their way. And he wouldn't have never ended up in Pakistan if he ever felt like a complete citizen in, in the full context of it. You know, I'm going to uh, end this by asking you a question that I, I talked to Yasha Munk about easy, earlier on the show. You know, as you look at this moment, if, as you look at Trumpism in its full flower and expression, does it seem to you more like a bug or more like a feature? In other words, do you think it's uh, uh, this moment is an aberration or is this an outgrowth of a kind of xenophobia that maybe got applied to Japanese in the 1940s uh, and even after World War II uh, that, that's, that's reared up in other places? Or are we going through something that's really unusual for us? Uh, so from my perspective, I see a lot of this happening everywhere in the world. Uh, you know, if you, if you study how uh, Saudi Arabia formed as a country and uh, their, their sort of resistance against globalism and wanting to stay insular, I, I see a lot of the same things being said at, during those times being said here in America, talking about this idealistic version of what life used to be and clinging on to this, this imaginary fake America land and how it used to be so much better and it was the golden age before... It got ruined by XX, you know, anything. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you kind of see the same thing happening in, in England, and also it happened in Japan, and it happened in China, and it happened in uh, South Africa, everywhere, where people... Uh, it, it's so easy to convince people that, uh, of this romanticized history that may or may not have ex- existed, you know, because uh, histories change 
and they're they're written by the victors. But hey man, Ismail, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to stop you here. I'm really really sorry. Oh, is, we're on okay. an interesting point here, and I wish we had five more minutes, but we are oh, flat okay. out of time. That's what the music in the background means. Eman <laughs> Ismail uh, is a video producer and editor at Slate Magazine. Work, watch his series. Who's afraid of Eman Ismail? I can almost guarantee you that you will learn something about probably yourself. Did America go?